Okay, let's begin this morning with a word of prayer. Our Father, as we come, we come in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Lord, for all of your blessings upon us. And Lord, we would pray thy blessing upon the service that even at this time is going on out of the auditorium out there of Holly High School. And Lord, we pray for the leading and direction and guidance of the Holy Spirit and the blessings of the Lord to rest upon them and upon us here in this place. Now, Lord, we pray that you would bless as we study the Word of God together. We ask the Holy Spirit to be our teacher and to give us fresh insights into the Word of God. Feed your people, we would pray. Edify them and challenge them anew and afresh, we ask. In Jesus' name and to his glory, amen. Okay, as we begin the six miracles of the cross, I'd like to ask you to take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to the sixth chapter of the book of Romans. The sixth chapter of the book of Romans. <clears throat> We're not speaking from Romans, but um, we just want to do a little thing here with Roman in Romans chapter six. No doubt you uh, know that the book of Romans is the sixth book of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then Romans, okay? And it's the sixth book, and we're going to look at the sixth chapter of the sixth book. And the verse we want is Romans 6, 6. So it's the sixth book of the, sixth chapter of the sixth book, the sixth verse, and the sixth verse says, knowing this, that our, our old man is crucified with him. Talks about crucifixion. That the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So here in this sixth book of the uh, sixth chapter of the sixth verse, if you notice the sixth word in there is man. Knowing this, that, our old, sixth word, man, okay? Six is the number of man. When God put his word together God, in the counsels of God's mind, he knew that, uh, that the word man would be the sixth word in this sixth verse of the sixth chapter of the sixth book. And that's significant because six in the Bible is the number of man. And the greatest miracle of all time is Jesus dying for the sins of men. And accompanying that miracle of the crucifixion, there are six miracles, very significantly, six miracles that took place there at the cross of, uh, of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, <clears throat> John 3:16, which I'm sure most all of us know, says, "For God so loved the world." He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He so loved the world. And every time I read that, I think of a little child trying to express something. It was just so big, or it was so long, or it was so funny, or it was just so great. That's, that's how a, a little children express themselves. They, they use that word so. And God did the very same thing when he put John 3.16 in the Bible. God so loved the world. How much did he love the world? He so loved it. He loved it as much as possible you could possibly love the world. And he proved that love by, it says, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is profound. It's a simple Bible verse, but it is profound. He so loved the world. Now, what was so amazing about that love? Well, he loved the ungodly. Notice on your note sheets, Romans 5, 6. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. He didn't die for the godly. He died for the ungodly. And aren't you glad he did? And then in two verses later in Romans 5, 8, but God commended his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't die for good people. He died for sinners. And the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So in verse 6, he died for the ungodly. 
And in verse 8, he died for sinners. Now, the greatest miracle that was uh, uh, of all time, Jesus coming to the cross, it was prompted by the greatest love of all time, for God so loved. And in John 15, 13, Jesus tells his disciples, greater love hath no man than this. Here, he says, is the ultimate of man's love. This is the, uh, the uh, ultimate scope of where the love of man can reach, that a man lay down his life for his friends. But that pales compared to the love of God. Jesus did not lay down his life just for his friends. Jesus laid down his life for his enemies as well. And so this love, it's a, the magnitude of the love of God is beyond human comprehensions. God's love, it's greater, far greater than man's love. Man, the greatest love man can muster up is to lay down a life for a friend. And there have been many that have done that. Many in the military have done that. I think of those uh, different ones, these stories you hear, somebody falling on a grenade to protect their uh, buddies and so forth. The ultimate of human love. But God's love far supersedes that. His love was for his enemies, not his friends and comrades. Now in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, the scripture says, Now abideth faith, hope, and charity, which is love, and these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Why is love the greatest of all three? Well, the faith of God won't save you. If God had faith in the human race, it wouldn't save us. Hope will not save you. If God had hope for the human race, it wouldn't save us. But love, God so loved the world. He loved the human race. And in 1 John 4, 4, the scripture says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Christ's love, it was demonstrated at the cross, and those that trust him, those that believe on him, he comes and dwells within. That's why the scripture says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The, the, the scope of God's love is just beyond human comprehension. We can't even understand John 3.16, actually, and uh, we need God's Spirit to understand God's Word. Now, the great, this great miracle of Calvary was accompanied by six other miracles. And this is what we're going to be doing over the next six weeks. We're going to be looking at those six other miracles that accompanied Jesus' death on the cross. And all of these six miracles took place within a 72-hour span. And we've listed them there for you. The first one was the miracle of the darkness. And that's what we're going to be covering today. Then there's the miracle of the veil. And then the miracle of the earthquake. And then the miracle of the graves that were opened. And the miracle of the bodies three days later that came out of those graves and then the miracle of the grave clothes itself. Each one of these, as we're going to examine them each week, you're going to see it's a miracle of God. Now today we're going to look at the miracle of the darkness. And perhaps you've never considered that darkness that was there at the, at the crucifixion as being a miracle. But folks, it was a miracle of God. <coughs> Pardon me. So when we talk about the darkness, Let's look at what the scripture says about it. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record the fact that when Jesus was hanging on the cross, darkness covered the land. In Matthew 27, 45, right at the top of the next page there, the scripture says now from the sixth hour, and when we have time given to us in the Bible, Hebrew time, it starts with sunrise. So the sun came up at six o'clock. And so the sixth hour there would be noon, six hours after six o'clock. It says from the sixth hour or from noon, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. That would be the ninth hour from the sunrise, making it three o'clock in the afternoon. So from 12 o'clock to three o'clock, darkness covered the land. And then in Mark chapter 15 and verse 33, 
It tells us the same thing. When the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And then in Luke 23, 44, it says it was about the sixth hour and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Now, in all three of these accounts, the, this miracle of darkness is recorded. Three times it is recorded. Now we can ask ourselves the question, where does the darkness come from? Where is the, did this darkness come from? It was 12 o'clock noon. And if you've ever been over in the Middle East there, almost every single day is a cloudless, bright, sunny, clear day. Very rarely does it rain over there. And so we can assume that the sky was clear that day, but at 12 o'clock noon, darkness settled in over the land. And this darkness was a supernatural invoked darkness because it lasted for three hours. And so we're going to look this morning at the miracle of this darkness. Now, from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, there was darkness. Three solid hours of darkness. So this darkness, as some have suggested, was not an eclipse of the sun. In the New Revised Standard Version, there is a footnote and by the way, the new Revised Standard Version, like the old Revised Standard Version, was put out by liberals and modernists who don't even believe the Bible. It's the National Council of Churches that, uh, that sponsored it. In the footnote of the new Revised Standard Version, it says, the sun was eclipsed. Oh, well, I can tell you on the authority of the Word of God, the sun was not eclipsed. Amen. There was no eclipse of the sun. And, and there's, for a number of reasons, we know there was no eclipse of the sun. First of all, number one, an eclipse does not last for three hours. Have you ever seen an eclipse of the sun? An eclipse of the sun does not last for three hours. It's just a few minutes. And if you've ever seen an eclipse of the sun, you also know that it does not produce total darkness. I've seen an eclipse of the sun and, you know, it didn't even get really dark. I mean, darkened down, but it, you know, it, it wasn't... You'd never mistake it for nighttime. And then thirdly, it's not possible to have an eclipse during Passover because the Jewish holidays are linked to the moon, the phases of the moon. And at Passover time, it's a full moon. And when the moon is full, that means that the sun is on one side and the earth is in the middle and the moon is on the other side. And, and so you've got a full moon. During an eclipse, the sun is on one side, the moon is in between, and the earth is on the other side. And it's the moon that eclipses, the shadow of the moon that eclipses the sun. So could, it was at, at a full moon, it could not possibly have been an eclipse. So where did this darkness come from then? Well, the scripture does tell us. And um, uh, this... What we're going to see here is that this darkness was sent from God. The sun was still there, but the sun was darkened. Now we're going to do a little quick study on darkness itself before we look and see how this darkness happened during those three hours that Jesus was on the cross. This might surprise you, but in Isaiah 45, 7, God says, I form the light and create darkness. God has created darkness. Darkness is a created thing. Now, I know what the theory of evolution teaches. The theory of evolution teaches that there was all darkness every place, and then the Big Bang took place, and this is where light came into existence. Well, that is 180 degrees different from what the Word of God teaches. Before creation, before anything was made that was made, it went way back in eternity when nothing existed except God. There was no darkness, there was only light. Look on your note sheets, 1 John 1.5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light. God is light. 
if all that existed in eternity was God, how could there be darkness if God is light? And that verse goes on and says, in him is no darkness at all. There's no darkness at all in God. There's, he's pure light. I should, maybe that's not a good term. <laughs> Probably not theologically correct. Pure light. But he's all light because God is light. And then notice right under it, 1 Timothy 6, verse 15 and 16. Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light. Dwelling in the light. He is the light. And he dwells in the light. And this is a light that the scripture goes on and says, which no man can approach unto whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Now I'd like you to um, turn your, in your Bibles, please, to the 104th Psalm, Psalm 104. The first two verses were to invite your attention. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. Do you know God has clothes? He's clothed with honor and majesty. But in verse 2, we read about some other clothing he has. Verse 2 says, Who coverest thyself with light as a garment. God is light, we read in 1 John 1, 5. And he wears light like a garment. There no dark, was no darkness in eternity at all. God is light, and he wears light as a garment. And I'd like you to turn, I'm doing a little speculating here, I'd like you to turn back to the third chapter of Genesis. And no doubt you're aware of the fact that Genesis chapter 3 is where the fall of man took place. Up until Genesis 3, man, the human race, was doing good. About Genesis chapter 3, Satan comes along, entices Eve, she entices Adam, they sin. And guess what happens when they sin? Look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7. The eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. I remember the first time I read that, I thought, how come they didn't know they were naked until then? How come it, you know, it, it wasn't until they sinned that they realized that they didn't, weren't wearing any clothes. Well, you know what I think happened? God is light, right? And he wears light as a garment, we just read in the 104th Psalm. And man, when God created him, was an unfallen being. And he was made in the image of God. I think Adam and Eve also were clothed in that light, in their unfallen condition. And it wasn't until they sinned that that light was snuffed, off, snuffed out. And there at the fall of man, they suddenly realized we're naked. And they sewed fig leaves together to try to hide their nakedness. They were covered with the garment of light because they were created in the image, in the very image of God. And so God is light. Look in uh, Revelation 21, verse 23 and 24. It's talking about the celestial city. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Twenty-six times in the book of Revelation, Jesus is called the Lamb. John the Baptist called him the Lamb of God. And here in the book of Revelation, we learn that the, it's the Lamb of God that is the light of the city. A light greater than our sun. You know, no need of the sun up there. And then at the bottom of the page, Revelation 22, 5, And there shall be no night there, no sun, no night. There shall be no night there, and they shall need no candle, neither light of the sun. Why not? For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Now, I had a man argue with me about that once. And he said to me, <clears throat> it says in Genesis 1-3, 
God says, let there be light. And there was light. He says, see, God had to create light. No, God didn't create the light. God is light. Genesis 1-3 is talking about the earth. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1-2, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep. That's the earth. And in Genesis 1-3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light on the earth. He, he, he brought the, the earth into the proximity of the sun. He, he's creating the universe here. He says, let there be light, meaning the light from the sun now began to shine on the earth. This wasn't the creation of light. God created light. I, I mean, sorry, God is light. He had to create the darkness, as Isaiah 45 tells us. The darkness was something that was created. So when the sky was darkened or when the land was darkened there at the crucifixion, God created that darkness. Now it's interesting that the scripture says, let there be light, and there was light, but at the cross of Jesus Christ, God, could, God no doubt said, let there be darkness. And there was darkness. Let there be light means light on the earth. Let there be darkness means also on the earth. Now how is this darkness accomplished? Well, the two key factors are that the sun was still up there. It was noontime. And that sun itself was darkened. Now remember we said there, there were three accounts of this. One in Matthew, one in Mark, one in Luke. And um, if, if, you look, if you look back uh, at the page uh, where we have those three accounts, there's a little tiny bit of difference in each one of them. It's a progressive revelation of this darkness. God doesn't tell all about it in Matthew. He gives us a little bit more information in Mark, and then he gives us a lot more information in Luke. Notice in Matthew, there was darkness over the land until the sixth hour. And then in Mark, it says, when the sixth hour has come, there was darkness over the whole land. So it wasn't just over the land, it was the whole land, the entire land of Israel. But then in Luke chapter 23, Luke's account, see, Luke was a doctor. Luke had a scientific mind. And he gives us some, some scientific, valuable scientific information concerning this darkness. He says it was about the sixth hour and there was a darkness over all the earth. Now in Matthew and in Mark, we read over the land. But Luke tells us there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And then the first part of verse 45 explains that darkness. It says, and the sun was darkened. The sun was darkened. Dark, God darkened the sun. He created darkness. Now, the word that is used there for the earth, the Greek word is the word, it's pronounced gay, but it's just two letters. It's G-E. That's the word for the uh, earth there. Darkness over all the earth. G-E. That's how it's spelled. And from this word, gay or G-E, we get our English words, Geology, that's the study of the earth. Geography, that's the mapping of the earth. So we have numerous words in the English language that come from this, world, uh, this word, and it means the whole world, the earth. There was darkness over all the earth. It wasn't just the land, as Matthew says, or the whole land, as Mark says. It's over the whole earth. And it was not the absence of the sun, it was the darkening of the sun. So the darkness of Calvary actually smothered the noonday sun. Now this darkness, it was not something that was a gradual darkness. It was an instantaneous darkness. The sun was darkened and it was worldwide, and it was instantaneous darkness. 
it was light and suddenly just like that it became the darkness of midnight and it ended instantaneously and you know how it ended you know how that darkness ended when the Lord Jesus gave up the ghost and he died God brought the light back on again so um, if you uh, if you notice um, or if you have noticed I don't know um, the scripture says that Jesus was on the cross six hours three of those hours he, he was crucified at nine o'clock in the morning and for the first three hours there was daylight and then for the last three hours there was darkness and let's just monitor what happened during those first three hours the three hours of daylight that Jesus was on the cross one of those things that happened during that time was when the thief on the cross repented he said to Jesus Lord remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom and Jesus answered him and says today shalt thou be with me in paradise it was still daylight darkness hadn't settled in yet that happened during those first three hours then Jesus watched from the cross as the Roman soldiers cast lots for his garments as they gambled to, to, for his garments and then it was from the cross that Jesus comforted the women the daughters of Jerusalem as he called them that were there and told them not to mourn not to weep for him and it was there where Jesus was on the cross that he committed the care of Mary he, he committed the care of Mary to John. He says, woman, behold thy son, uh, son, behold thy mother, and so forth. It was there while Jesus was on the cross during that daylight hour that he listened to the scoffers rail on him and spit on him and hurl insults at him. But then suddenly, just like that, instantaneous total darkness settled over the, the, the cross there. Now an interesting parallel, when Jesus was born, he was born at night and the night turned to light we read in Luke chapter 2 there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field keeping watch over their flock by night and lo the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were sore afraid why were they afraid because it was night and suddenly it's daylight all around them what did they see? They saw the light from God. The angels were there and the glory of the Lord. And the glory of the Lord is his Shekinah glory. They saw the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. They were greatly afraid. So at Jesus' birth, the night became light. But at Jesus' death, the light became night. Just, just the opposite. The light became night. So we re as we study the scriptures, we find out that not only did God create the darkness, as he says in Isaiah 45, 7, where he said, I create the darkness. But as we study the scriptures, we find out that God controls the darkness also. He controls the darkness. Now in Exodus, back in Exodus chapter 10, when God sent the plagues upon Egypt to convince Pharaoh to let the Hebrew children go, when he, was, uh, when he sent the plagues upon them, one of those plagues was darkness. And that darkness, we're given a description of that darkness. So just translate that into those three hours at the cross there to find out what kind of darkness it was. Here's what it says, right down the, the bottom of the page there. Exodus 10, 21 through 23. The Lord God said to Moses, Stretch out thine hand towards heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt. Now see, God can control this darkness. This is not a worldwide darkness. This is a uh, controlled darkness. It's only over the land of Egypt. In fact, not even all of that, as we'll see. But it goes on and says, Even darkness which may be felt. Darkness so thick you can feel it that's really dark and it goes on and says and Moses stretched forth his hand towards heaven and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days this darkness land lasted three days the darkness at Calvary only lasted three hours 
But for those three days, there was a thick darkness, the scripture says, so thick it could be felt. And, the, and our passage goes on and says, they saw not one another. Can you imagine living in the same house with people? And then I'm sure they stayed in their house. They weren't going to go outside. They'd get lost. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. They were just <laughs> trapped at home or wherever they were. Then and then we have the word but. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. The Israel's, Israelite slaves lived in the land of Goshen, which is a, like a, a city within Egypt. And God controlled this darkness. It settled upon the whole, the whole um, uh, nation of Egypt for three days, except in one little area, in the land of Goshen. And there they had light. So this is a controlled darkness. It's a created darkness, and it is a controlled darkness. And this darkness, the darkness God sent, it was thick, and it could be felt. A number of years ago, my wife and I took a vacation down in Kentucky, and we visited Mammoth Cave. And that's quite an experience to see. Uh, we got down there in the cave. Of course, they have electric lights all through the cave, and uh, we're with a guide. He's, he's leading the group through. <clears throat> and we got to this one big room in the cave. And he says, now I want everybody to stand still. I don't want you to move. You stay in one place here. He says, we're going to do something. He says, we're going to turn out all the lights. And he says, we're going to let you see what total darkness is. Now, we don't really know what total darkness is. You know, at nighttime, there's city lights moonlight, starlight, headlights, all kinds of, of lights. So even though it's dark and you might stumble and so forth, it's not total darkness. This was total darkness, darkness that could be felt and darkness that was uh, thick. And so they turned out all the lights and he says, now don't move if I stay there. And of course, when it gets dark like that, this is total darkness, uh, the pupils of your eyes begin to dilate, you know, and they. They get big, and, and um, as that, we stood there in that darkness, I thought of this passage from the book of Exodus. You could literally feel that darkness. It was like it was just pressing down on us. And it literally feels like you could just reach out and grab a handful of it. And he says, now don't move, everybody stay there. By this time, our Pupils are all dilated as big as they're going to get. And he took a match. He struck a match. And that match flared up when it flared up when it lit. I'll tell you, it was like the rising sun. It was the brightness of the sun. We're all sitting there, big pupils. <laughs> You're standing there. And that, mat, that match it was, it was so bright. We were in total darkness. And just that little bit of light from a match just seemed to illuminate the whole place. That's how thick and how heavy that darkness was. Well, when Jesus was on the cross, he was on the cross for six hours, three hours in daylight, and three hours in darkness. And you know what that's a picture of? Here it is. For God so loved the world. Half of the world at any given moment is in darkness. Half of the world at any given moment is in light. And when Jesus died on the cross, it was for the whole world, the half that was in darkness and the half that was in light. For God so loved the world. Now this worldwide darkness, and that's what Luke says it was, it covered the whole earth, the G-E, the gay. This darkness, Luke says, um, was uh, uh, covered the whole earth. Secular historians have recorded that very same thing. Men like Celsius and others have, uh, as they've written history, have talked about th this day of darkness all corresponding to that hour back there uh, when Jesus died upon the cross. And uh, so it was, it was a worldwide historical event. Well, Let's consider on why did God send this miracle? When Jesus died on the cross for three of those hours, the earth was, the whole earth was encompassed in total, thick, heavy 
darkness that could be felt. Why did Jesus send this, or why did God send this lesson of darkness? And we're going to give you a number of reasons why we believe. Number one, the Jews wanted a sign from heaven. Boy, they wanted a sign from heaven, and they got one. Way back 700 years before the uh, birth of Jesus Christ, when God prophesied his birth in Isaiah 7, 14, the scripture says, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Oh, here's a sign. God's gonna give us a sign. What is this sign? Well, it has to do with the coming savior. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. That's impossible, that's supernatural. Yes, it's a sign. That's why it's a sign. It's something that could not possibly happen as far as is humanly possible. But we're not talking about what's humanly possible. We're talking about what God did. He said, I'm going to give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. So Israel, here's your sign. You're going to have a sign. It's going to be a virgin born savior that's going to come uh, one day. Now this sign was ignored. They ignored this sign. When Jesus is contesting with the Pharisees in John 8, 41, notice, notice what they say to him. Jesus says, you do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, look what they said. We be not born of fornication. Did those Pharisees believe in the virgin birth? Not for a minute. Did they believe Jesus was the virgin born Emmanuel, God with us? Not for a minute. They said, we be not born of fornication. In other words, implying Jesus was illegitimate because they knew that Joseph was not his father. Joseph never claimed to be his father. Israel was told he was born of a virgin and it was announced by angels and it was prophesied by the prophets and it was seen there and they saw, they saw the whole thing and he was the virgin born son of God. But the Pharisees said, Hey, you're born a foreign occasion. You're illegitimate. So 700 years passed from the time Isaiah said, the Lord will give you a sign, a virgin shall conceive. And for 700 years, Israel is looking for a sign. When Jesus comes on the scene, they ignore the sign. And so what do they do? They're still looking for a sign. John chapter 12 it quotes what the prophet Isaiah said, and it says how he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts and be converted and I should heal them. He says, I, give you, I gave you a sign and you rejected that sign. So what do we see when Jesus meets up with, with the religious leaders? They're looking for a sign. Matthew 16, verse 1 to 4, notice with me. It says, the Pharisees also with the Sadducees. Now, anytime you could get Pharisees and Sadducees together to agree on anything was a very unusual thing. They were miles apart theologically. And yet, here they come together in a unified cause. Why? because they wanted to attack the Lord Jesus. So Matthew 16 says, the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign. We want a sign. Give us a sign. Do something supernatural. Do some magic. Work a miracle. Show us a sign from heaven. And Jesus said, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonah and he left them and departed. He says, you're not getting a sign. You've had your sign. Then in Mark chapter 8, we read, and the Pharisees. Well, this time it's just the Pharisees. There's no Sadducees around this time. But it says, the Pharisees came forth and began to question him, seeking of him a sign from heaven. And how does G Jesus answer? He says, why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. In other words, you've got your sign. It was promised 700 years ago, and the sign has been fulfilled. Then in Matthew 24, 3, this time it's not the Pharisees, it's not the Sadducees, it's his own disciples. And here's what they say, Matthew 24, 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came, 
unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world, or the end of the age? And then in John chapter 2, it's not the Pharisees, not the Sadducees, not the disciples, but just the Jewish people themselves. John 2.18 says, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Well, the things he did should have been a sign. Then John 6.30, Then they said, therefore said unto him, What sign showest thou then, that we may see and believe thee what thou doest? And in John 4, verse 48, next page, Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The Jews constantly desired to see a sign, something supernatural. 1 Corinthians 1.22, Paul says, For the Jews require a sign. And all through Jesus' ministry, they bugged him to death. Give us a sign, give us a sign. Well, God gave him a sign. He said, This is a sign a virgin shall conceive. And it happened. So now at the crucifixion, because they took him and with wicked hands, as Peter says, they crucified him. God gives them a sign. The sign was darkness. Prophetically, the spiritual darkness that they were living in. And Israel became without excuse. Just imagine if you were there that day. You see that darkness settle in like that. Instant, and not, I shouldn't say settle in, instantaneous, just like that. And then end, just like that. Wouldn't you think, maybe God's behind this? But they didn't. Never seemed to, never seemed to phase them. And so the purpose of the one side, of, of the darkness, first of all, it was to show them a sign that Jesus is the Son of God. Secondly, the darkness magnified the death of Christ. The crucifixion was a common event back in the first century. Very common thing. That's how they executed the criminals when Rome was in charge. And the crucifixion of Christ was not an ordinary crucifixion. And it was amplified and exemplified by God sending supernatural darkness upon the face of the earth. So the message of the darkness is the Jews wanted a sign. Secondly, it magnified his death. And then thirdly, the darkness covered the Lord Jesus in his darkest hour. It hid him during the shame of the cross there. Now in um, Matthew 27, 45 and 46, it says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, which would be three o'clock in the afternoon, this is when the darkness ended, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatini, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So the final hours of Jesus' life here upon this earth was in the darkness. It covered him and in it hid him from those that were looking on. They didn't get to see the horrors and the anguish and pain that he had to suffer there as he hung, <clears throat> as he hung upon the cross. They didn't get to see his face when he cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It was hidden by the darkness. They didn't get to see him when the, the scripture says, he became sin for us that knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God for him. When he actually became sin, every wicked, foul sin that man is capable of, he became that sin hanging on the cross. It was shrouded in the darkness of God. And the, Peter and James and John, they witnessed his suffering in Gethsemane, and others witnessed his suffering for the first three hours on the cross, but those last three hours, he died. And when he died, light returned. The three hours of darkness ended. Fourthly, the darkness portrayed the doom of those people that crucified him and rejected him. It warned the lost concerning eternity. In Matthew 25, 30, 
Jesus says, cast ye out the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is what's in store for those that reject Jesus Christ. You die rejecting Jesus Christ. You've got an eternity of darkness to look forward to. And Matthew 8, 12. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In Jude, verse 13. It says, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. It's forever. 2 Peter 2.17. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. The future of those who reject him. This darkness portrayed their future an eternity of darkness well in the year 33 AD on the 14th day of the month of Nisan from 12 o'clock noon to 3 o'clock in the afternoon God gave the whole world a sampling of hell he gave them a sampling of an eternity without the Lord Jesus Christ. Darkness covered the land. And then fifthly, here's the fifth lesson of the cross. It fulfilled the prophetic scriptures. In Amos chapter 8 and verse, verses 9 and 10, it's talking about the day of Jesus' crucifixion. It says, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, I will cause the sun to go down at noon. God even prophesied Amos 800 years before the birth of Christ. He prophesied the exact time the darkness would come. He says, the sun will go down at noon and I will darken the earth in a clear day. That's how we know it was a clear day. It was prophesied, it would be a clear day. And he goes on and says, I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. And I will bring upon you sackcloth upon, uh, 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 sackcloth upon all loins, baldness upon every head. And I will make it as, notice, the mourning of an only son. The mourning of an only son. That brings us right back to John 3.16 again. For God so loved the world he gave who? His only begotten son his only begotten son. It was a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Now, in the scripture, we have natural, or we, or we have, I guess, physical darkness would be the best way of describing it, and we have spiritual darkness. Now, spiritual darkness, there's four different types of spiritual darkness. And the darkness there at Calvary that day typified the spiritual darkness, the four different types of spiritual darkness. Number one, there is natural darkness. Natural darkness. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shine. The people that walked in darkness. Today the world is walking in darkness. It is as far as spiritual darkness is concerned, it is natural darkness. Um, they have no knowledge of who Jesus is. That's why we're to be witnesses for him. That's why we send out missionaries. That's why we're, we are to publish the glad tidings. They're walking in darkness. And it's a natural darkness. People are not naturally Christian. They are naturally lost. The Bible says, The natural man understandeth not the things of God, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2.14 it's natural darkness. And in John chapter 8, verse 12, the scripture says, He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of light. One who chooses Christ will not walk in darkness. But up until the fact, time that you get saved, you're walking in darkness. You're living in darkness. Everything you do is in darkness. And when you accept Jesus, the Bible says, You shall not walk in darkness anymore. Ephesians 4.18 says, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through ignorance. There it is. 
through ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts. People are ignorant today of the plan of salvation. They're ignorant of the word of God. They're ignorant of Jesus Christ. They're ignorant of who God is. They're ignorant of John 3.16. They're ignorant of uh, Romans 6.23. They're ignorant of, of all of this great salvation verses and the, and the plan of salvation. This is all natural darkness. And this is why we are exhorted by the Lord to shine as lights in the midst of a dark and perverse generation. But then secondly, there is a purposeful darkness. And this darkness is a darkness that comes upon a person after he hears and he rejects Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 23, but if thine eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Isn't that an interesting verse? If the light that is in you be darkness, how great is that darkness? In other words, this is darkness that is on purpose. They, are, they deliberately, willingly reject Jesus Christ. In John 3, verse 19 and 20, this is the condemnation that is uh, that has come into the world, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Who's the light? Christ. They hate Christ. This is purposeful darkness. They hate Christ. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. So there's natural darkness, there's purposeful darkness, and then there is judicial darkness. Judicial darkness is when a person rejects Christ and continues to reject Christ and continues to reject Christ. Finally, he reaches a place where God is just going to leave him alone. And he may live for years after that, but he will never be saved because God has taken his hand away from him and he is living in a judicial darkness. He's already been judged and sentenced as far as God is concerned and he's just waiting to die to, get in, uh, to spend eternity in that darkness. Jeremiah chapter 13 and verse 16, it says, give glory to to the Lord your God before he caused the darkness. If you're here today and you're not saved, accept Christ, give God the glory before that judicial darkness settles into your life. And then it says, and before your feet stumble upon the dark mountains. That's why the Bible says today is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. And then it says, while ye look for light, he turn it into the shadow of death and make it gross darkness. Gross darkness. You're looking for light, but it's too late. You've rejected Jesus one time too many. And he turns that light into gross darkness. That's judicial darkness. And God creates that darkness in the hearts of many people. They reject Jesus one time too often. And then fourthly, the fourth kind of darkness is eternal darkness. Jesus talked about that in Matthew 25, 30. Cast him out into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. He mentioned it again in Matthew 22, 13. Cast him into outer darkness. There should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He mentioned it in other places, Matthew chapter 8 also, and in other places of the Bible. That's eternal darkness. And there's no escaping eternal darkness. There's no getting out once you're there. And so um, uh, the darkness there of the cross is a great miracle that God performed, the miracle of darkness. And it ha has many lessons accompanying it that apply to us today. Now then, if you'll stand with me, and we want to have a benediction together we close this time. I want to thank you for coming and uh, remaining faithful here in the class. Uh, we wondered how many would be here and uh, praise God to see so many of you. Um, let's look, let's look, look to God now. And now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy 
to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. You are dismissed.